here to welcome you. I'm sure he'll be joining us um, soon during the day. He's wrapped up. And um, so it's my privilege and honor to welcome my good friend, Dr. Aaron Sams. I like to add the doctor in front because he's done. Congratulations, Aaron. And um, it's uh, been a long journey working with Aaron. Uh, Aaron's one who invited me to join this Flip Learning Network. And um, I'm really appreciative of him for doing that. I spent four, five years, I think, on the board of directors as the chair and some time before as a board member and now a board member. And um, Aaron was influential on, on a lot of my teaching. And uh, I just wanted to thank Aaron again for all his work and friendship. And I'd like to let you get started on your talk, Aaron, so people can listen to the important person in the room today. Yeah, well, um, Kate Baker's here and so is Helene Marshall. Those are the important people that I know of that uh, have influenced me. But uh, as I'm getting my screen going here and figuring out my technology, um, Helene Marshall, she and I had breakfast one time. She was in Pittsburgh where I live now. Um, and I was considering going back to school to get my doctorate. And I asked her, should I do an EDD or a PhD? And she said, Aaron, do a PhD. And so I did. So Helene, I just wanted you to know, I am, as of two weeks ago, I'm done with that. And thank you for encouraging me to go down that route. It was a long uh, five-year journey, but I'm thankful that you nudged me that direction. And I'm confident that that will be a good decision. Um, everyone else who I've been saying hi to as you've been coming in, thank you so much for being here. And also those of you who are continuing on with the Flip Learning Network, those of you who I know and have known for years and those who I've never met, um, this is a, it's, it's one of my babies. One of the things that I helped get off the ground many years ago when we started, I think back in 2012, um, and, uh, you know, as, as Ken has said, he, he's been on the board and has served as the chair. Um, I, I had done so as well as one of the founding members, and I'm just thankful to see, A, that it's still alive and well, B, that it's in really good hands, and C, that it's just grown into this international community. As people are coming into the session today, I'm just grateful to see people from all over the world, from all aspects of education, and uh, it's really exciting to me. Uh, I had no idea, you know, when things got going that it would turn into this. I always dreamed that it would, um, but I, I, I didn't know if it would, and I'm just thankful to see that it has. Um, so I've got a lot I want to get through today. I want to tell you a little bit about me and my story and my transition as an educator. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some directions that I see happening in education technology and I, what I think the pandemic has done uh, positively for education and possibly negatively and where I think uh, we as uh, people who have uh, been flipping our classrooms uh, have a leg up and I think can kind of steer things uh, in coming years in education uh, based on our experience that we've been doing this for a while and we didn't have to adapt in 30 seconds when everything shut down a year and a half ago. We were able to pull from our toolbox and uh, help lead the charge and I think we can continue to do that as educators. So without further ado, uh, if you found me online, you probably have seen this picture. That's about 10 years old now. Uh, so I look a little bit more like this these days. Um, a few of you have probably seen me like this. If you do encounter me like that, just give me a glass of water, get me in an Uber and make sure I get home safely. But uh, what I want to do today is I want to take you through uh, my journeys as an educator, as I mentioned, and I want to do this in four chapters. And um, this, some of you may have seen some of these slides before. Uh, you know, you can't rebuild a presentation every time, but I've uh, updated a few things um, recently that I think might be useful to some people. So if you've seen some of this before, or just take a nap, go back, go get a cup of coffee and come back in five, 10 minutes and you might see something new. But um, I wanted to talk about, uh, first off, teaching. Uh, I come from a long line of educators. Uh, this is my family when I was about 12 years old. Uh, my mom is an elementary school teacher. Uh, my, my dad uh, has his degree in accounting, uh, but uh, chose to become a coal miner. Uh, my younger brother went to one semester of college, decided it wasn't for him, and went to become a coal miner. He now makes about three times as much money as I do. And, um, uh, but my family always value education. I'm really thankful for that, that, um, that I come from a long line of teachers. My grandmother was a teacher. My grandfather was a principal. I have many aunts and uncles who became educators, and I'm thankful to be part of that. Uh, I married an educator. My wife is a teacher. She's a uh, now back in the classroom as a reading specialist um, and I uh, have who knows what my children might end up doing but it's a long line of educators in my family and they valued education 
And as I became a teacher uh, back in about 2000 is when I started teaching, I was really good at giving a lot of live presentations. And I thought, I, I, I think I was fairly creative in the way I presented material. I blew a lot of things up because I was a high school chemistry teacher because where else can you get paid to light things on fire other than being like a pyrotechnician? Um, and I had a lot of fun. My students had a lot of fun in my classroom. And, um, but then the technology started to kind of trickle into my classroom. And that's when, you know, around 2006, 2007, the whole flipped classroom thing started to uh, to grow up and started to take off. And you are all, all, all are familiar with that. I'm not going to have to rehash any of this stuff with this particular audience. But as you know, we're taking uh, direct instruction out of the live classroom. We're offloading that to individuals, sometimes outside of the class, sometimes not. And we're bringing what was being done outside of class back into the classroom. Again, you all know this stuff, so I'm not going to uh, rehash this too, too much. But um, during that process, uh, what I did is I began my transition as an educator. I used to be really good at giving live presentations, as I mentioned, and then I started to flip my classroom. And on you, a lot of times you'll hear the phrase flip classroom 101, uh, as referred to in, in um, one of my early books. I know that that, that, that that phrase is still being used a lot. And that's that, that first step of taking your direct instruction and offloading that on to uh, video as an instructional tool. So I made that step, I took that step and I did that for a short while. And that's when I discovered a lot of what is now, uh, you know, obviously referred to as mastery. And we kind of merged them together and talk about flipped mastery. And those of you with any sort of uh, background in education are familiar with Benjamin Bloom and might be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy and his work with mastery learning. So what we do, we took this idea of using direct instruction on video, combining it with, uh, with an asynchronous approach to education where people can move through material at a pace that's more appropriate for them, and uh, mastery learning kind of morphed uh, into the whole conversation of flipped instruction. Now, those of you who are here are probably uh, no stranger to this guy, Ramsey Musalem. Uh, he called me out many, many years ago after we had both been kind of experimenting using video. And he said, hey, Aaron, I think you're doing something wrong. You're putting the video at the wrong part of the learning cycle. And if you're familiar with the learning cycle, it starts with an exploration. It is supplemented with instruction. And then you're doing something with what you've just learned. Learn. It's it's the it's the the cycle of learning that turned into the inquiry cycle uh, later on. So um, based on that, he encouraged me to reconsider some of the order that I was doing things in. So instead of front loading with video, he said, "Hey, you know what you should be doing, Aaron, is letting students explore content and then exposing them to your instruction um, uh, using video and using it for appropriately when students were there." And this is cool. Like it made sense to me pedagogically. It was backed by research, but it what it really annoyed me is that I spent all this time making this video content and now I was only going to use it as a supplemental tool rather than my primary teaching tool. And doggone it, I put a lot of work into that, a lot of effort. And um, and now I was just going to have to, you know, uh, make that take a back seat to what was, you know, strong uh, instructional uh, uh, philosophy of strong instructional uh, technique. It's inquiry learning method. Um, so, you know, around this time, we're talking, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, a few things started to come onto the market. Things like Wolfram Alpha, that any kid could just type in information and it would spit out answers. Things like photo math, where you could literally take a picture of the math problem and um, your uh, students would uh, be able to just have the answer produced for them along with every step along the way. And a lot of teachers freaked out about this. They said, well, how in the world am I supposed to teach now with, uh, with all of these tools available where students can just jump in and and answer all the questions uh, without ever having to do any work and my answer to that was well the technology is there their access to this information is there so maybe we as educators need to start rethinking how we're teaching our students and given the fact that they have access to all of this we can't hold our knowledge, we can't hold our content area so close to the chest. We as educational experts have to acknowledge that the content is out there and our job as educators is to get students access to the material that they need when they need it just in time in their learning progress. So instead of just giving students content when we think they're ready for it, um, on our schedule, we need to give them access to what they need as an individual uh, learner when they're ready for it in their um, their journey through through learning material. Now that was a hard thing for me to get my head around. Chemistry that I taught is very linear. It doesn't change a whole heck of a lot. Chem chemistry hasn't hasn't 
change in 100 years, at least general chemistry. Granted, there's research happening in, in crazy fields, but nothing that you're going to learn about in, you know, in high school where I was teaching at the time. So the, a lot of teachers struggled with this idea of not teaching on their schedule, but, but giving things to their students on the student's schedule and when students were ready. So what this forced me to do is to think more differently about my students' individual needs as learners. And that's about when I, the time I discovered universal design for learning. Again, anyone in education line, you've probably heard of this. The idea is instead of designing for the middle and hoping you get most, you design for the fringe and everybody benefits. You design a system in which your high flyers and your students who struggle can both operate within the system appropriately and everybody benefits from this. Now, this is hard if you're delivering one education to a class of 30 students. Again, if you're aiming for the middle and hoping you get most, yeah, you'll get most of your students, but you're disenfranchising the fringe. But if you aim for the edges and you create a system where everybody can operate within the system, that's beneficial to all of the students, it's beneficial uh, to the teacher, but it takes a lot of work. It's hard on the instructor and it requires thinking differently about how we approach education. If we think about it one size fits all, you're not going to be able to operate well in universal design. If you think about it uh, in terms of universal design for architecture, we used to build buildings with lots of stairs. Then we started building ramps for people to access the buildings who couldn't access stairs. But anyone who can access through stairs can also access through a ramp. So by approaching the problem differently, we design for the fringe, everyone can still access the building. We do the same thing in our educational settings and everyone can learn in ways that are meaningful to them. And we as educators, it's our responsibility to create environments for them to do that. So that led me then to be able to embrace project-based learning, uh, where students now, instead of just doing all of my material, watching all of my videos, doing all of my content, they had options on how they were going to learn the material based on projects that they were working on. So for example, I had student, uh, one student who was a really good welder, uh, you know, joining two pieces of metal with really high heat and lots of electricity. Um, he was really good at it, but he, was, and he didn't particularly care for a lot of his academic work, but I told him he could do a welding project to learn about atomic theory. And he did beautifully. He spent most of his time down in the welding shop rather than in my classroom, but he still learned about atomic theory and created a brilliant presentation about how atoms are interacting with one another through the process of welding that showed his understanding of, of atomic theory. Is that how I would have taught atomic theory? No, I don't know anything about welding, but this kid was able to take something that he loved as well as the chemistry content that he needed to learn, marry them together in a project, and it was a brilliant example of project-based learning. Now, my journey along at this point is uh, was uh, was just that. It was a journey. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I was doing project-based learning at the time. I had stumbled upon it and then learned later, oh, this is what this is called. This is project-based learning. And this is right about the time, this is right around 2012, right around the time when this whole flip classroom thing started to explode. Now, if you're playing along at this point, you probably have a education buzzword bingo. So go ahead and fill out your card. So yes, Kate, here's the bingo card. You, it was coming, you know it, you saw it. Um, but um, at this time, I started to kind of get this weird, bizarro kind of flipped learning guru status. And um, at this time, I also left the classroom. I went on the road full time. I was traveling 120 days a year. Um, I also moved to Pittsburgh to help a graduate school establish a distance learning program. And um, my whole life got turned upside down. Uh, so this is where some transitions started to begin. So that's my chapter two. Let's talk about some transitions that I went through uh, as an educator. So I've talked to you about uh, how I've changed as a teacher, but these are just some transitions I went through professionally and how that impacted me. Now, um, I'll call this part Confessions of a Chemistry Teacher, and I have to sadly say I'm a former chemistry teacher, which does make me kind of sad uh, because I really, really love teaching chemistry, but um, I don't quite do that anymore, but I've kind of stumbled my way back into something similar. Now, when I moved to Colorado in 2006, I had every intention of retiring as a high school chemistry teacher. And then all of this flipped classroom stuff kind of landed in my lap and exploded. And I took a different career path. So in 2012, I decided to leave the classroom and I really, really missed interacting with my students. That's what I missed most. 
my students. Um, and I still miss my, my high school students. These three in particular left a very lasting impression on me just for their love of life and their love of chemistry. One thing I don't miss is I don't miss being the safety enforcer in my science classroom. It was always, uh, I was just not good at it. I'm kind of messy. I'm kind of disorganized in my classroom, uh, often failed in the safety aspect. Um, I also was um, really uh, bad at drawing. Um, every time I try to draw something for my students, so for example, I would maybe try to draw, I don't know, like a test tube or something, and I'd be talking to them about chemistry, and before you know it, I'd hear students starting to snicker, and I realized that I couldn't draw, and every time I did try to draw something, it started to look like something that high schoolers would start to snicker about, and so I had to move on from that. Now, about this time, uh, like I said, I'm traveling all the time, I'm on the road, and I've become this person who, here I am in Taiwan, uh, you know, giving a talk about the flipped classroom. And this was really, really weird for me. Again, my dad's a coal miner, my mom's an elementary school teacher, I'm from a long line of educators, and now I'm in the spotlight and people are expecting me to know something about education, and all I can talk about is my own story as an educator. And that's what I that's what I did. I, I traveled around the world and I told my own story as an educator. And uh, it was crazy. It was wild. It was weird. I also don't recommend it. Um, I was um, I had a young family at the time, married, had three kids. Um, I, my my kids were small. Uh, my son was about five. I had twin girls that were about three at the time. And that's a hard time to be on the road. Life on the road is taxing. It's not easy. It's not glamorous. You wake up in a hotel room, you don't know where you are. Um, it took a toll uh, on me. It took a toll on my mental health and things kind of came crashing to a halt. And I realized this is not what I want to be doing with my life. I don't want to be doing the dog and pony show traveling around the world. Um, and it also, I ended up struggling uh, with a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, this is something that um, I think, Kate, you were probably there the first time I publicly talked about this in New Jersey a few years ago, but it's something that I had to embrace that that this is not what I want to be doing. It's, it's really impacted me. And as a result, I've had to deal with these struggles in my mental health uh, as a result. So I took a big time out. Um, this is a right around, oh man, I don't know, probably five or six years ago. Those of you who uh, you know might have followed me on social media and might have you know seen Aaron around all the time, he just disappeared. I just fell off the face of the earth. So what was going on? Some people are like, what happened to Aaron? Where did he go? So this is partly what happened. I needed to crawl into a hole and I needed to get myself back on track. Um, so I did what every middle-aged man struggling with depression should do. I enrolled. In a PhD program, because you know that's what you should do when you're uh, when you're tired, you're burned out, your your mental health is struggling, you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. You should go back to school. Now, this was a great option, actually. Um, the program that I went through was at Texas Tech University. Um, it was uh, mostly uh, remote, so I did most of my work from here uh, in Pittsburgh, but uh, I did have to go to Lubbock, Texas uh, every every year or so for a while. Um, and I, as I was telling those of you who were just trickling in, I just finished. I defended my dissertation back in April, finished all my revisions recently. It's done, and now I'm just waiting for that diploma to arrive. So I'm very, very grateful that that is finished. Um, and I chose to study curriculum instruction and STEM education. A lot of people are like, why didn't you go research flipped classroom stuff? I'm like, yeah, I needed a break. I wanted to get back to my roots as a high school chemistry teacher. So now what I do is I work at a small college, uh, St. Vincent College. It's here in uh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. And I teach full time in their education department. Uh, so I teach uh, pre-service elementary teachers how to teach science and math. Uh, I teach uh, pre-service uh, middle school and high school teachers how to teach science. Um, I teach some general education classes uh, in our education department. Uh, I, I teach education psychology occasionally. Uh, tonight, I get to teach a new class on philosophy and ethics in, uh, in education, which is really, really cool. I'm excited to teach that class, but that's what I'm doing now. Um, so a lot of people say, well, do you still flip your classroom? And I say, yeah, kind of, sort of. Um, a lot of what I've learned as an educator along the way, I still do in my classroom. Um, do I lean as heavily on video as I used to? No. Do I still use videos in as, as an instructional tool? Absolutely. But what I've done is I've really just doubled down on what do my students really need for me right now when I'm in the room. And we've been talking about this for years, for the, you know, for 
over 10 years since we've been talking about flipped classrooms, the question's always been, what's the best use of face-to-face -face class time? That question continues to haunt me. Am I doing with my students right now the most effective and efficient use of the time that I have with them, or am I just spewing out content that they could learn from my, by reading a book? That's my question that I continue to ask myself. So that's been my transition. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. I'm no longer teaching high school. I'm now teaching pre-service teachers, which I absolutely love. I think finally, and now at the age of 44, I've figured out what I want to do, what I want to be when I grow up. And a lot of you have, have, have helped shape that for me. Um, so what I want to reflect on now is uh, how, how, what I'm, uh, some observations that I've made by hitting pause, by taking a step back, I've seen a few things emerge in the last five, 10 years or so. And a lot of it has to do with, with education tribes. And sometimes tribes are great because you kind of find your people. You find the people that you love, that you're like-minded with, but sometimes tribes are not so great. So I want to throw a few things out there, a few observations that I've seen about tribes. And when I'm done talking about tribes, we'll move on to technology and I'll kind of give you a few of my reflections about that. So here are some tribes that I've found. I've got Team Steam. So those are your STEM Steam people. Uh, Google Apps for Education or Google Suite for Education Geeks. You got your Maker Maniacs, all about Apple and your Flip Fanatics. Okay, those are the five people that I'm, the five groups I'm going to talk about now. All right, so we're going to talk about Team Steam. This is my, this is my role. I'm a former science teacher. My PhD is in STEM education. Um, my dissertation, I was looking at influences that have shaped STEM and STEAM coalitions. Are they different? Are they the same? Are they true to what the National Science Foundation found out? What are some of the policy influences that impacted and have morphed into what, what STEAM is? Now, some of you science people out there are, you know, you hear the word STEM and you're like, yeah, we're all about that, especially the science part, because that's first and it's really important. And as a former science teacher, I kind of gravitate that way. And some of you are saying, yes, but the STEAM thing is important. And I don't care if you're a STEM person, or if you're a STEAM person, but uh, the, 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 the thing is here is we've developed these tribes around STEM and STEAM. And some people are hardcore, only one or the other. And my question is to what end? Why have you formed this tribe? Why have you gravitated towards one or these or the other? And what are you leaving out by saying, I'm on this side and I'm not on that side? Um, so some things I would like you to consider are, what is the importance of the acronym? Does it actually mean something? And how has that influenced what tribe you're a part of? So to what end? Why have you gravitated here? And I want to continue to ask that question here for a little while. All right, so you Google people. Some people are all about the Google suite. That's what they use, their school uses. They've gotten all their Google certifications, their Google certified trainers. There are some amazing products out there that help you become an efficient educator. But I've learned a couple of things recently. My wife is a reading specialist um, for students at a very, very uh, underserved community. And despite the fact that all of her students have devices, and despite the fact that the school district and the local internet companies will help provide internet access, and despite the fact that they have assured that every single kid can get online when they need to, there are still kids who don't show up, who can't show up, whose parents cannot help them get online and are still being restricted from accessing some of these things because of a technology gap. Not necessarily they don't have the device, but there is a gap in being able to use it and being able to use that effectively as a teaching tool. So we might be all about our technology. And I've been talking for years that maybe the, the technology gap isn't as big of an issue as we think it is. I'm going to backpedal a little bit on that. I'm going to say that I think the technology gap is still an issue, despite the fact that we put the content or, or the material and the hardware out for our students. This is still a major issue that is yet to be overcome. And until we can figure out a way to make sure that our kindergartners, our first graders, and our second graders, when they're not sitting in our classroom, have equal access to the educational opportunities to the students who have support and guidelines at home to be able to get online, there's still going to be a technology gap that can lead to an education gap. And the challenge with those of us who love our Google products is they are dependent upon having technology and having access to the internet to be able to use. So I love these products, but as, our, as we develop our tribes, we have to remember 
that our tribe is important. It helps us as educators, but it might still be disenfranchising some of our students. So I just want you to keep that in your mind. And that's not limited to Google. So I just want you to, to remember that. But ask yourself, to what end? To what end do I love these products and associate and affiliate myself with this tribe? To what end? Do I do that? Yes, for professional growth, for professional opportunities to become a more efficient and effective educator. But to what extent do I do I do I hinder what my students are able to do by going all in on that? All right, my makerspace maniacs, those people who are all about STEM, you love your makerspace. Makerspaces are awesome. I supervised one in my college. Um, I, I train students to, to manage it. I help design it. I teach classes in it. I teach a class on, on STEM and STEAM that's, uh, that is primarily about using makerspaces. But some people have, have, have gone all in on this and said that this is going to change and revolutionize how we teach students and revolutionize education. And it's great, I'm glad it does. Um, what I can't quite figure out is, so I grew, I'm, a, I'm a farm kid. I was born on a farm. I grew up in a small town. My dad was a coal miner. My dad fixed everything. My mom made everything from scratch. My mom made cross stitch. She cooked all of her food. My wife and I make everything. I make beer on my own. I renovated my own basement. I'm uh, working in my garden right now. I built some new garden beds this year. I'm in the process of building a new chicken coop. Uh, we can food. We make all sorts of stuff. My children make everything from scratch. So I, I couldn't quite figure out the fascination with makerspaces early on. But then I realized that, wait a minute, not every kid grows up in a situation where their parents did everything from scratch. And so some students have never had the opportunity to be creative and to make things and to do things for themselves and to create something out of nothing, to create a helmet out of a box, to make um, you know, a marble race out of junk that you have lying around. So makerspaces are really, really important and I think helping students uh, exercise some of their creativity. However, I think billing makerspaces as the be all and end all of the thing that will uh, encourage students to, to, uh, to develop all of these 21st century skills like collaboration and communication and, and cooperation, things like that, and creativity, it's one way to do that, but it's not the only way to do that. And so like, gutting half of your library to put in a makerspace, I don't think it's gonna solve all of our problems. Makerspaces are great, but I'm not sure that we need to put one in every school, in every room, and they're not gonna revolutionize education the way we think they are. So to what end? Why are you so excited about makerspaces? Is it to give students opportunities they wouldn't have, or do we think that this is going to change education in ways that it may or may not? Okay, Apple people. I love my Apple products. I have all the i things. I have all the Apple things. I'm doing this uh, uh, this presentation from my my giant 27 inch iMac. I'm using my Beats Flex uh, headphones to hear what's going on, which are now owned by Apple. They're shiny. I love my shiny objects. They're amazing, and I I buy Apple products all the time because I absolutely love them. Ken, I can see the look on your face because this, these are not uh, Linux product products that I didn't build. For they're locked down. I can't. I can't open them up and break them. And I am. Just, I know how you love your, your your Linux things that you can break. But I love my Apple products. But I have to do, uh, caution us all against shiny object syndrome. And I, I'm just using Apple as an example. And I'm using all of these things as an as an example. As you can see that of of just things that we can get our uh, get so wrapped up in that we think I think we lose sight of what is the end goal here. To what end do we want all these shiny silver objects? To what end do we want iPads in all of our children's hands? The tool itself is not going to change the way we interact with the students. The, the makerspace is not going to change the way we interact with our students. But if we use these things properly, they will realign the way we think about how we teach. They realign the way we think about how students learn. And they realign the way we think how we can take good pedagogical practice and maybe make it more efficient, maybe reach more students and maybe tap into more students who might otherwise be overlooked. And I think Google tools, shiny Apple products, makerspaces, STEM and STEAM and all that goes into that are great ways to do that. 
Okay, now I want to really address why all of us are here, and these would be our flipped fanatics. Okay, so why are we flipping our classroom? Why do we think video is an, infect, is an effective tool? Now, when I started doing this many years ago, I went all in. I flipped all my classes. I made all of the videos for everything, and I realized that I didn't need a video for everything. When I was teaching atomic theory, I realized that making videos was probably one of the biggest wastes of time that I did because that was not an effective way to teach that particular subject. So we can't get wrapped up in, uh, I'm doing this thing because this is my tribe, so I have to go all in on it. But what aspect of this is pedagogically sound and will actually allow me to reach more students and help them uh, become more effective learners and to, to what uh, end am I doing this that will help me become a more effective educator. So that's the question I want you to think about as you're, you're in your little tribes as you gravitate towards things and it's not restricted to these five these are just five that I pulled uh, of uh, out of the air that I see people kind of gravitating around at you know at conferences and, and online and conversations that I'm having, you know, pick your your tool. You know, for Ken, it might be Linux, you know, uh, um, and for Kate, you know, your, your Edmodo crew and things like that. These are all wonderful tools. And they're great opportunities to, to, to explore how these things can, can, can uh, expand our students' opportunities. But we have to be careful that we don't get too hung up with all of them or too clickish in how we relate to them and who we relate to as we are educating our students. So to what end? Are we doing this? So now I want to address the big existential crisis that we've all been facing, I think, for the past few years, and it's kind of drove the, the title of this session. This thing, this idea of flipping our classroom has been around now for almost 15 years or so, or give or take how you want to count it. Is it still relevant? And I think that flipped learning and a flipped classroom has undergone a little bit of an ex existential crisis. We've heard about it. So we, we, we started out just using videos. We call them, you know, educational video podcasts. We flipped our classroom. We've had flipped learning. We've moved to personalized learning. We've moved to, um, uh, you know, active learning. So we're constantly repackaging and re-talking about how we're flipping our classroom. And it's kind of become like STEM or STEAM. Everybody has their own kind of conception and idea of what this is that it's almost lost all meaning. I did a presentation in Spain a few years ago and I learned of a new phrase when I was in Spain. And it's this, aunque la mona se vista de seda, mona se queda. And loosely translated, it means you can put a monkey in a dress, but it's still a monkey. Okay, so if we constantly have to repackage things to make it remain relevant, it's still a monkey. It's still the same thing. So what are we doing? What are we repackaging? And what's actually going to be useful for our students? And this is the existential crisis that not only flipped learning and flipped classrooms face, but every educational trend constantly faces. What's gonna last and what are we just clinging to to make it uh, that our group and our tribe continue to remain relevant? What is actually going to move on? And that's what I really wanna talk about what I think is gonna have lasting power in the coming years. So a couple things, what did flip learning do for me? As one of the kind of, kind of, you know, one of the OG flipping guys, what did it do for me? First and foremost, it got me, and that's me by the way, away from the front of the classroom. Okay, it got me to be someone who's facilitating education rather than just telling my students a bunch of cool stuff. And I think even more importantly is it got rid of the front of the classroom. It really flattened the interaction that I had with my students. And I've really been able to carry this into higher education where um, I've tried to, to, to kind of get rid of the vertical structure of the classroom and we can all be learners together. And that's what really, really, uh, uh, flipping change for me with well, the contents out there the the, the materials out there I, you know i i'm not someone who's super brilliant who is the only person in the world can, who can teach a particular subject there's plenty of information out there but what i have is experience as an educator i have certain expertise that i can bring to the table in the college that i teach for my students in our context that they can't get anywhere else and that i could never have been able to do it if i'm only standing in the front of the classroom delivering new content and new material here's another revelation 
for a lot of years, we've been saying flipping the classroom is not about the video. The more I think about it, I think that's actually wrong. I think it is all about the video. Now, is good education all about using video as a teaching tool? No, absolutely not. Good education is pulling excellent technologies, great techniques, sound pedagogical practice with you know solid philosophies of education. That's what good education is about. But I think flipping a classroom is all about using video as an effective teaching tool. But what that does is it unlocks other things. So rather than repackaging flipping the classroom as something else and just dressing up monkey, let's just acknowledge, let's call a spade a spade. Flipping the classroom is all about effectively using video as a teaching tool so that we can get time back with our students. That's where I'm at with all of this. Now you might disagree with me on that and that's totally fine. But I'm the guy giving the presentation, so I can do whatever I want right now. But what I think I see flipping is a piece of the educational pie. It's not the whole pie. It's not the whole thing. It's one slice of it. Okay, so remember the slice of the pie that you have that it doesn't encompass the whole pie. There's plenty of more pie for, for other people. There's a lot of ingredients in that pie that make it really, really tasty. And flipping is only one portion of that. Now, as I was preparing for today, I was looking back at some of my old presentations that I've been giving for the past, when did I start? 2008, I think it was the first time I gave a presentation about flipping a classroom. So the past 13, 14 years, okay? It's been a long time. So I found one and some of these slides were somewhere around 2013, okay? So in 2013, I gave a presentation on the future of the flipped classroom. And I found some slides and, and the, the title of these were in five years time, Here's what we're going to see. So that was in 2013-ish, maybe 2016. I, I was kind of using these slides for a few years. So let's say it was 2016. So five years from 2016, this was the prediction five years ago. Let's see how, we, let's see how we're doing. First off, learning spaces. Has flipping the classroom changed learning spaces? I would say yes, it absolutely has. If you were using video as a teaching tool, as I mentioned, you're no longer in the front of the classroom. You might've completely got rid of your front of your classroom. You've probably rearranged how your students use the learning space. And in light of the pandemic, we've all learned this new learning space called Zoom. And we have all had to figure out how can I effectively teach my students in this learning space. Now, those of us who have been flipping for a while, already have been thinking through how do we use learning spaces differently. That was not a hard transition for us to move into a Zoom environment, whereas people who were glued to the front of the classroom had a heck of a time making that transition. So has flipping the classroom affected learning spaces? Absolutely. And I think it gave us the mobility, the flexibility, the versatility, and the, the agility to just keep talking on LY words. Those are what adverbs, Kate? Help me out here. Okay, thank you. Um, to, to be able to do that. And um, so uh, agility, that doesn't end in L-Y. I'm a liar. I, so this is why I teach science. I can't write. I can't speak. Um, but but yes, it absolutely it gave us the ability to, to adapt to new learning spaces. So I think we nailed this one. Okay. All right. So the next one I found in my presentation from years ago was that gamification was going to come take over the world. Now, there, I, a lot of learning platforms have nailed this gaming uh, gamification thing. There's quite a few of them out there. Um, and I think it's okay. I think, yeah, it kind of unlocks some of this. It was it dependent on flipping? No. Does flipping work well in a gamified situation? Yes. I'm a still a little on the fence about gamification. I always have been. Part of it is um, I'm more of kind of a, I take more of a cognitive approach to learning than a behavioral approach. And I see just a lot of behaviorism uh, in gamification uh, in terms of rewards, in terms of, you know, stimuli and th things like that. And it works. I'm not going to deny that it works, but I'm a little hesitant about that because I think um, we can uh, run the risk of manipulating our students if we don't do this ethically and responsibly. And um, at some point, games just lose, I, we lose their, we lose interest in them and you then have to create the game to to trigger those things even more just like social media companies do to try to get you to coming back and back and back to the app more and more time getting more eyes on it where you, we, we have to just optimize the game rather than i think optimizing the learning processes so i'm a little I, i'm still on the fence with gamification all right, what else? Hiring. This was one of the things that we're going to, flipping is going to change our hiring practices where we're going to have to hire people that have certain skills. Now, I think a savvy 
HR department and a savvy principal and a savvy department head are going to seek out people who have technology skills and hire them over people who don't. Um, in the teacher training program that I have, we, we, in most states, they have education technology um, certifications or, or guidelines that we have to accomplish. Now, flipping may or may not be part of that. It probably isn't. Um, in my department, my department chair actually included a flipped classroom module in, part, in our education technology uh, curriculum. It's not required by the state, but it's part of what our students have to demonstrate some competency in. Do I think it's necessary? Eh, maybe. I think it's helpful. Um, but I do think that, that who we hire is changing. And if we want to remain relevant, we're going to have to remain uh, up to date on how a lot of technologies are being used in the classroom. And just to be able to facilitate a Zoom session. You know, as people were coming in, Ken was giving some guidelines on, on you know, keeping people muted, on uh, how to avoid Zoom bombers, how to admit people to the classroom, things like that. Like those are really, really important guidelines that a lot of, a lot of teachers and professors who don't have even just the baseline understanding of how to use technology are just going to become overwhelmed with. So hiring people who can already navigate that because of their training or because of their exposure to education technology, I think is becoming, uh, has become important and will continue to be important. So hiring practice, I think it is. Differentiation. This, I think, is my biggest benefit to flipping a classroom is that I'm able to meet the needs of individual students more so than I ever have before. Now, do all teachers who flip the classroom do this well? No. I think this is one of the greatest potential benefits of flipping a classroom, but only if the teacher does this with fidelity and actually engages with their students. The temptation, and I've seen this, and I've seen this in teachers of my own children in their school who have flipped their classroom poorly, that they... they made some fantastic videos, and then they didn't actually utilize that class time to differentiate for students. They, it was still business as usual, okay? If you just do business as usual, I'm not sure you've gained a lot from the flipping process, and I'm not sure that the, that it, that the, the costs of content creation and changing the way you're doing business outweigh the benefits unless you really get your head around differentiate, differentiation. Um, so did did, did, has flipping help us become better differentiators? Yes, but some people have not done it well. Personalization. I think I'm still on the fence with this one. Has flipping helped facilitate personalization? Yes. Um, have we done it effectively? Not always. And is personalization always good? I would say no. There are times when everybody needs to do some same things. There are certain skills that everybody needs to have that a personalized education I don't think is going to allow us to do. Now, can customization, some individualization, some more differentiation, is that good? Yes. But an exclusively personalized education for an absolute individual, eh, I'm still on the fence there. We have standards. We have we live in societies that have, agreed, have agreed upon that these are things that we want all of our students to know and be able to do. And that's still important. And I think there are things like, uh, you know, content that they need to learn, uh, empathy for their, for their fellow human beings that they need to understand, um, you know, just, just certain, certain ways of interacting with the world that we simply can't expect everybody to pick up on their own through a personalized education, that we as education communities, learning communities and classrooms have to absolutely actually come together to do together and cooperatively. So, um, so again, does flipping facilitate personalization? Yes. Is personalization always good? Not so sure. Lastly, student created content. Students, kids are creating videos way more than I could ever have imagined. My, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, so our, our kids are producing video content at a scale that is just, I can't even get my head around. So at the time, yes, students are creating video content for their classrooms. Great. That's really cool. But our kids, my own children are creating content. So just more than I, I, I can, I, I could not even fathom that five, six years ago. So absolutely. Now, has flipping our classrooms facilitated this or has simply the ease of creating video done this? Probably more so that the latter, that the ease of creating video is just out there. There are platforms for video creation. 
But again, those of us who started using video 15 years ago in our classrooms, I think have a leg up over others who didn't because we're now able to meet our students, meet our children in ways that they're used to and that they're familiar with. And, that, and, and we've been talking about that for years. So I think that's been helpful. So now post pandemic, how has teaching and learning in the pandemic um, uh, changed the way we've done business and has, has flipping our classroom allowed us to adapt better? And I mentioned this earlier, I think having used video as a teaching tool and having gotten our heads around how do we use our learning spaces differently has given us a leg up. It's put, it put uh, those of us as, as part of this learning community, the Flip Learning Network and others like it, just way ahead of the game. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was I was doing work at three institutions, St. Vincent College, uh, where I work full time. I'm all, in addition to teaching in the education department, I'm also the faculty uh, education technology liaison. I help people use the learning management system and things like that. I was getting questions that I had answered a million times in, in professional development opportunities that I'd given that three people showed up for that I had wrote about in my book 10 years ago that I, I was like banging my head against the wall saying, we I... I, I smugly but quietly said, I told you so, that I, I, you should have been learning this stuff a decade ago, but now when you have to do it, you're scrambling. Like, but those who had, had made those changes, boom, they took right off. And I was helping people along the way who had refused to make the changes and refused to think differently about their classroom. So we were ahead of the curve. Now, what worked? I think two things worked in the pandemic. One was, um, adapting to a particular platform and going all in on that platform, either going all Zoom, all Google, whatever it was, you just went all in on it and we didn't like it. We didn't like not having our students face to face. We didn't necessarily want to go all online, but we went all in. I think that worked. I think meeting the needs of our students and providing them access to content, that worked. But some kids, as I mentioned earlier, didn't make that transition. They didn't get over that technology gap and that didn't work. Couple other things that I don't think worked, the high flex model, the quote unquote hybrid models where you are teaching live in class for some students socially distanced and you had students uh, remotely that are up on your big screen. I tried that. I've seen other people crash and burn. There's one group of people that that worked well for and that's the stand in front of the classroom and lecture and not interact with any students because they could still stand in front of the lecture. There was the camera in the classroom that captured that. It didn't matter if you were in class or if you were remote, that model worked. But if you actually talk to your students and you actually interacted with your students, it's nearly impossible to do that face-to-face -face and over Zoom simultaneously. At the same time, it's even more difficult to do that at an elementary level where you're trying to manage unruly second graders. It's a little easier in a college classroom where students are a little more cooperative and compliant and they want to be there. But I don't think that model worked very well. Again, prove me wrong. Maybe you did it really, really well. But I've seen that uh, be, uh, I think that crashed and burned. So let's talk a little bit now about education technology and where I think that's heading post pandemic and what we think, what I think we can learn. First off, what's technology for? I think it makes us more efficient and more effective, okay? So if technology makes us more efficient, then I think it's a useful tool and we should embrace it. But if it slows us down, even uh, it'll slow us down a little bit at the beginning while we're learning, but if it slows us down, if it makes things more cumbersome, we should abandon it. Unless it makes us more efficient, we have to, I think we have to let it go. Now, flipping our classroom, there's a big learning curve. There's a big time curve that you have to overcome in content creation to be able to get to the part, point where you're more efficient. Get over that hump, I think you're good to go. But I want to issue a little bit of caution. I hear people saying technology is a tool. That's true, technology is a tool by definition. Then I hear people say technology is only a tool and they use this to justify using technology for anything or using any technology, just implying that it's only a tool, it's not gonna actually change anything. But I disagree with that. I don't think technology is only a tool. I think technology is not only a tool, it has an impact. And some of you have heard me talk about this. If I wanna get from here in Pittsburgh to let's say uh, New Jersey, where Kate is, I have options. I can drive, I can take the bus, I can take the train or I can fly. Now, all of those things are gonna get me from point A to point B. But my experience as a traveler along the way is going to be very, very different. And me as a human, I'm going to be a different human being at the other end of that experience as I would have been if I had taken one of the other forms of transportation. So what is ed tech for? 
If I read about something, if I hear someone give a lecture about something or I watch a video about something, I might learn the same content in terms of the material, but my experience as a learner is going to be different along the way. And I'm going to be a different human on the other side of that learning experience as I would have been if I had uh, taken a different route or learned in a different route. So technology is not only a tool, it is a tool, but the technologies that we choose when we teach and learn affect the final product. They are not neutral. They have an impact. And so when we choose a technology, be it chalk, be it an overhead projector, LCD projector, or smart board, those have an impact. Now, granted, those are all teacher presentation tools, and I would say have a minimal impact because they're all still teacher presentation tools. So the difference in the experience of the learner on the other end is going to be fairly, fairly minimal. But once we start getting devices in kids' hands, and it becomes an individualized tool for learning, and we can start to meet the needs of an individual learner in ways that we weren't able to before, that's where technology starts to have a greater impact. When the experience of the individual becomes more diversified and more different, the, the experience and the, the human that emerges on the other end is going to become more diverse and divergent. And that can be a good thing. But as I mentioned earlier, there are some things that we want everyone to experience to have a common set of experiences on the other end. So what technologies you choose to use to accomplish those things will have an impact on the final result. So picking a technology that is fancy and shiny and sparkly and is supposed to be the new and uh, amazing thing, we have to think very, very carefully about what we're using in the same way that a pencil probably impacted how uh, technology or how students learn because that's different than using chalk and slate. It has different outcomes. It's more permanent and it has a different impact on the learner, just as any technology we choose has an impact on the, on the, the students. So we have to think about is what problem are we actually trying to solve with the technology that we, that we know of? So this is a problem. Okay. Right. We've all been here. Okay. This is a problem and all problems need to be solved. Okay, so when we choose a technology to solve a problem, we have to think, does the technology I'm using actually solve the problem or is my solution a solution for a problem that doesn't actually need to be solved? Or is it a, solu is it a solution that doesn't even have a problem, which I think some ed education technology tools are. So when we embrace them, we have to figure out what we're actually trying to do with them and then think carefully about what the final impact and the result of the human that comes out on the other end of that experience looks like. All right, so some final thoughts. I told you my story of going from a lecturer to a full classroom person. I embraced all these things along the way and I became this education technology guru, uh, kind of, I don't know, reluctantly, I guess you could say. Um, and that I was, at this point, I was pretty, uh, pretty unhappy. Um, Where's my happy face? There it is. But you'll also notice that the word flipped classroom has kind of made, moved its way off, off the screen. That unlocked other things for me along the way. Okay. Um, now, thankfully, um, I learned a few things here. Along the process, I was trying to make all of these things be part of flipped classroom. And I was trying to say, oh, flipping is this, and it's that, and it's this, and it's that. And I realized that I, I think I was trying to cover too much with Flip Classroom, where Flip Classroom probably would have uh, kind of ended there. And I realized that my reliance on using video became less and less and less the more I embraced some of these other pedagogical techniques. And so rather than trying to brand it all as Flip Classroom, what I realized is that I was really moving towards a more human-centered approach to learning. And during this time of traveling around the world all the time, I was getting really frustrated because all I was talking about was flipping because that's kind of the thing that I was known for. But I really just wanted to talk about what it's like to teach and learn with technology with for humans and, and, and using that to help shape the humans that we want our kids to be. Now, thankfully, I'm back in the classroom. I'm back, I've been back in the classroom full time for four years now uh, at St. Vincent College. I was an adjunct there for a few years now and they're full time and I absolutely love being back in the classroom and I'm happy again. Why? Because I'm not trying to make full classroom everything, but I, I recognize the, the, the importance that flipping my classroom had on shaping what I'm comfortable with and what I'm willing to do in my own classroom. And I keep coming back 
to this question, again, I pulled this from my slides from, from eight years ago. What's the most valuable use of face-to-face -face clash time? This question was relevant then, and this question is still relevant now. Whether you're going to flip your classroom, whether you're going to use project-based learning, whether you're going to use any other pedagogical technique, but what is the most valuable thing that I can do with the human beings that are in my classroom in that short, short time that I have with them? This question will never become irrelevant. This question will drive and guide my uh, my my technique, my process, my thinking as an educator until I retire and probably thereafter. And I want this question to be the thing that shapes everyone that I interact with as long as I'm still in the classroom and as long as I'm still giving presentations, as long as I'm training new teachers is what's the best and most valuable use of the time that you have that I have as a teacher with our students. So I've shared with you my journey. I've shared with you the steps that I took along the way, going from a lecturer to a flipped classroom person to someone who embraced mastery and all those things along the way, who left the classroom, who got frustrated, who realized that I had to be with students and I had to be in a classroom. The steps that I took to get back there, what I kept from my experience and what I've moved away from. And that's my story. And those are my steps. And you're going to have your own story and you're going to have your own path. So don't feel like you have to path, follow my path as an educator. I was a high school chemistry teacher who wandered into doing a dog and pony show on the road, who's now moved into higher education. And you are, will very likely not go on that same path. Maybe you will. More power to you. But what can you learn from what you've learned from your flipped classroom community, from your other tribes, from your experience as educators? And how can you bring that in your classroom? And how can you use that to shape what you, um, how you're going to interact with the human beings you have, be that over Zoom or be that face to face every day for the rest of your life as an educator? And that's the question I want you to ask. What's the best use of your face to face class time? And as long as you keep asking that question, You'll know what the right techni techniques are, you'll know what the right technologies are, and you will know how to best teach your students. That's all I've got. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going to hand things over to Kate, but uh, Kate Baker, and uh, to talk about what's coming up next. But if people have questions for Aaron, I'd love to see some questions in the chat for Aaron. Yep, so feel free to post those questions. Um, the rest of our co-hosts on this will keep an eye in the chat for your questions and we'll call you out to ask it. But uh, well, as thanks, we wait Gina. for your questions to come in for Aaron, I wanna just give you a brief tour since I have you all here as a captive audience, a brief tour for what you can expect coming up. And let me just share my screen. All right, so um, all of you should have your, um, be logged into Edmodo, have your free Edmodo account. When you first log into Edmodo, you'll probably be on the home page and you'll see Flip Tech 2021 over here in your little sidebar. Uh, and you can navigate directly to that group. Uh, you might also see some Flip Tech um, posts that are appearing real time in your stream of posts that are um, on the home page. But if you wanna see exclusively just the Flip Tech posts, navigate to the group and you'll see a few things to help us out with our timing of our sessions. So over here on the right, I had to check my lefts and right. <laughs> we have um, in the mini calendar here, you'll see here is the you know event that we're currently in at this moment, which is the Flip Tech um, keynote with Sam's. And then we have an event for every single one of the session blocks. So you have multiple pathways to get to where you want to go. You can click on session block A, and then this will open up and you can navigate directly to the post that has the session information. You can also just come over here on the left side, go to session block A, and You'll see here's the post that has all the information. So you can now go and navigate and click on the link for the video conference. Uh, I'm keeping an update, uh, an eye on Edmodo all day long. So if you have any issues, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, make it a habit to refresh your screen uh, as we've had to update some of the Zoom links. Um, and we are excited to do sessions A, B, 
C and D today, in addition to uh, a happy hour at the end of the day and an afternoon uh, keynote that you'll see there too. And you can always keep the conversation going in our Flip Tech Lounge. Uh, so this is a spot where we can talk about all the things, all the things for today, okay? Uh, all right, so Ken, do we have any good questions coming in on the chat? Yeah. I blasted yeah. Aaron as well on your WhatsApp if you wanna have it available there. That yeah, I just saw you. him on my phone, thanks Ken. Um, so real quick, does your next session start right now? Yeah, uh, we've we got a couple of minutes, it's good. Okay, I'll, it's, a I'll different quick, it's a different link, we, we'll run this one a little long, it's fine. Cool. All right. And I will be quick about this because I actually, I, I have to go run and pick up my son. He's at his SAT prep class. I got to take him to work. <laughs> so, okay. um, but uh, so uh, I guess that's one good thing about doing these things online is like I can still play do daddy duty here. Okay. So I'm going to answer these really quick. Ken says, um, there's a question here from the Philippines it says, how do you encourage the learners who are already discouraged to learn because of the online setting? I would say, get them off the online setting as much as you can. Uh, one of the things that I learned in my PhD program is uh, how to do a lot of um, uh, like global collaboration. So we had our students building, let's say balloon powered race cars. Um, uh, I had to build an identical one to some students in Taiwan. Um, and so just getting away from the screen and having to do something with your hands. So creating assignments that get them off the computer is one way to do that. Absolutely. So just, uh, you know, if they're burned out, have them do something else. Have them go outside, have them make something, have them build something. Um, question number two is how do you assure your students acquire learning in your class and online discussion? Lots of formative feedbacks, so a lot of or formative assessment questions immediately after video content. Um, yeah, you know, uh, a lot of Q&A, a lot of discussion boards, that kind of stuff that you can monitor and get uh, immediately uh, just in time feedback to do that. Uh, another question says, so what should we do if the school puts restrictions on the material or tools you're supposed to use? So if you're only restricted to using Google tools, just use Google tools. It's totally fine to do that. Um, if you can only use the thing, you know, Microsoft, then find the Microsoft tool that's going to work. There might be other ones that are easier to use out there, but but use the ecosystem that you have rather than fighting it. It's going to be make your life a lot, lot easier. If there's a content that you have to teach, if there's required course material, use that. Record the required course material. Give a presentation on the required course material. Use that material. You don't have to try to buck the system. You don't have to try to overcome that. Um, use what's there and, 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 and figure out um, uh, you know, what's going to be the easiest and Ken's talking about cognitive overload with, uh, for, uh, you know, teachers who try to use too much stuff. Again, pick one system that works best for you and, uh, you know, go all in with it. So I talked about tribes and I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, look down on anyone who's like fully embraced something. I just want to uh, issue a little bit of caution on when you go all in on a particular, uh, uh, thing. So, um, yeah, that's all the questions that Ken sent me in the chat. And I know you'll have to get elsewhere and I, I need to go pick up my son. But um, if there's a discussion board somewhere, Kate, that people can post questions to and that I could respond to a little bit later, I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, so just uh, send that my way. And what time's the happy hour? Um, the happy hour is at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. It, oh, I'm teaching tonight, so I won't be able to make it, but uh, I would love to have, have come, but maybe, maybe. All good. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, if there's other questions, just keep posting them and I will find a way to get uh, answers to you. But thank you all for having me, uh, Flip Learning Network and others, Ken, and, and those who invited me. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to see all, all these familiar faces and to meet all the new ones. And I look forward to future interactions. Thanks Yay, again, Aaron. Thanks, thanks. Really. Much appreciated. Take care. Sending a hug. All right, everyone. We're going to slide on over to session block A. And I'm going to, and I'm going to drop the link to the post 